The British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam. Next slide. And now I introduce to you um, from the Cardiology Technology Program, the program head, Cindy Masaro. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. It's, it's great to have you here and interested in the program. So um, yeah, looking forward to hearing some great questions at the end. Please don't be shy, put them in the chat. Um, and at the end, if you want to talk live, we're happy to do that as well. So um, today we're going to, I'm going to outline um, what we're going to cover here. We're going to do a program overview. We're going to talk a little bit about the program delivery. Um, and then also what the clinical looks like in the program, because that's always of great interest. Um, we're going to look at job opportunities and um, cardiac sciences opportunities for continuing education after you finish a diploma in cardiology technology. And then we're just gonna do a brief overview of the admissions process and entrance requirements. Um, so we're gonna go from there. So I'll start with the program overview. Um, the cardiology technology program is made up of 21, um, oh, can you go backwards? Thanks. The cardiology technology program is made up of 21 courses that include um, both uh, academic courses, which we call didactic courses, uh, a, a lab, and uh, clinical courses. Um, we have a blended model of delivery, and I just spoke about the three pieces. The online courses are delivered um, with, their, with a flexibility from term to term. So as a part-time studies program, you, you don't necessarily have to take a full course load. You can take a couple courses at a time and work. Um, you can take a full course load. And um, so that's the one of the advantages of taking our program. And um, I think a lot of people really find that the flexibility to do that is um, an advantage for sure. Um, there are 26 weeks of clinical at hospitals across Canada. So we have what's called affiliation agreements with uh, all our hospitals across Canada. Um, there's many different sites in, in each province. And um, so generally we have, we have the ability to put students at like um, students at, at uh, the site that they prefer. Um, the lab session is really interesting and cool. Um, provides active practice and application um, to the, all the courses that you learn in the theory courses. And the students attend this on campus. So that is the only time students attend campus. It's two week period. Um, and then the clinicals are also in person, of course, at the hospital that you're assigned. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the clinical practicum. There are two practicums in the program. Um, one is right after your first set of 10 courses and it is two weeks long. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's 10 weeks long. Um, it come, right before that comes the lab that you take before you get into your first clinical. The second practicum is 16 weeks long and um, that is taken at the very end of all the theory courses. It's all in a hands-on hospital environment and you get great exposure to some of the advanced areas like pacemakers, electrophysiology. Um, you can, you'll get exposure to working with children in, the, in, in that area. Um, so it, it will give you that kind of exposure and that's, that's pretty unique to BCIT cardiology program as well. Next slide, please. So I can talk a little bit about the job opportunities and career outlook. Um, we are looking really good. Um, we've had increased demand in this area and we have lots of managers and um, sites across Canada that are asking for students and graduates. So it's a good time to apply to cardiology technology. Um, generally, you'll be getting a job right out of the gates and uh, may not be full-time right away. We often see students start part-time or on a casual basis, but definitely an increase in demand. Um, once you graduate, positions that uh, can be found in hospital environments where you do your clinical environment, uh, your clinical practicum, um, you, students can also, graduates can also work in the uh, laboratories, medical labs, so often there's holder scanning or ECGs that are done in lab. Um, cardiac rehabilitation facilities, we do have a cardiac rehab uh, course in our program 
and uh, students will also get exposure to that area while they're in their practicum. So there's some opportunities for that. Um, another exciting area that uh, people are interested in is medical device companies. So companies like Philips and GE that sell um, uh, ECG machines and Holter scanning and treadmill systems, uh, all the modalities that you'll learn in the program. Um, they hire uh, graduates with a few years of experience and usually a, a degree to work in um, training, training people in the hospital system. Next slide, please. So I did touch on this briefly, but we have some really good laddering opportunities at PCIT here, um, particularly in our cardiac sciences program. And um, so if you look at the, the graph on this side, um, it says diploma, advanced studies, bachelor degree and graduate certificates. Um, our program after you finish uh, the two-year program and graduate and work in the hospital for at least two years in a cardiac clinical setting. Um, you can apply to the, any of the listed programs, after physiology, the pacemaker device program, or the cardiovascular program. And each of those programs are specialized um, programs that you would take here, and they have approximately five courses with a clinical. So um, it's you know, it's exciting and it, it's a, it's a invasive area of practice, whereas cardiology technology is non-invasive. Um, but many people are interested in that and there are jobs in that area, those areas as well. Um, there's also an opportunity to transfer your credits to TRU, which is Thompson Rivers University uh, in a health sciences degree program. So we have an agreement with them to transfer the credits that you take from um, completing your diploma to finish the degree in health sciences. So that's a great opportunity as well, because a lot of the advanced um, areas of practice out there, not, not particularly the three that I just listed, but um, other programs like perfusion and sonography, um, working for medical device companies, all of those areas generally require a degree. Next slide, please. So here we have one of our graduates, um, Robin Unger, and she has just listed out a, a testimonial about the program. So you can have a little um, how the the team collaboration and patient care was interesting for her. Um, the technical skills that she learned, she now uses in her career. Um, and also she, she mentions that um, having the coursework set up in such a way that there was lots of flexibility and that you could do a lot of your components of your program um, on your own. It's not, definitely not a go as like a um, your own pace kind of program, um, but it is certainly uh, has opportunity throughout the courses to take um, take your time and learn some, some um, pieces on your own. And then she was very, um, she's very involved in the advanced programs as well. So she's definitely a, a model graduate who has taken the device program, cardiac rhythm device program. And then she's recently begun the um, electrophysiology technology program. So there's um, one of our graduates and I believe you'll all get the slide deck um, since it's been recorded so you can read more about what Robin has to say. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so a little bit about admissions um, and admissions to the program. Just going to move this so I can see. So we have two entry uh, dates that we take students into the program, which is unique for us as well. Uh, the first one is if students want to start in September, the application period is from January 2nd to April 30th. If they want to start in January, the application date is July 15th to October 1st. Um, so the program length in this part-time studies program really depends on the number of theory courses that you take each term. So you can take a couple, you can take one. Um, 12 to 18 credits is approximately uh, two years to complete. And that's like a full-time 
you're setting yourself for a full-time program. It's strongly recommended that we finish this program, that students finish this program within a five-year period. Um, and, and the biggest reason for that is some of the content gets refreshed. And so when you go to write your national exam with the Cardiology Technology Association, you want to have the latest information and um, be successful on that exam. Next slide, please. So some steps, basic steps for application. Um, you want to review your requirements and application dates. Um, and then it's, um, it says here to convert all your documents to PDF files. Uh, then you will, once you have all your met all your mandatory uh, academic requirements, you'll complete the mandatory questionnaire and a CASPER test, which is essentially a test that looks at softer skills and has it's scenario based. Um, it's a test that is not run by BCIT, but we get the results and we combine those results with your mandatory questionnaire and your uh, your academic requirements, and we look at um, scoring the uh, applicants that way. And then you apply online at bcit.ca. Next slide. Um, required entrance requirements. I'm not gonna read through them all, but you can see that um, you re you're required English, anatomy and physics and chemistry. Um, the cat we CASPER test we just talked about, the mandatory application questionnaire, it actually uh, involves this about I think it's 10 questions and it talks about um, we ask you to list things like you know what do you know about the program how do you think you'll be successful what are some traits that you have that will that will complement the program and and um, you being successful as a cardiology technologist so doing your research is definitely definitely important it also um, asks about uh, volunteer experience and work experience. So if you have that, that also gives you a little bit of an advantage. Um, just on the right hand side, it talks a little bit about preferred requirements. So although we don't require that you have a post-secondary education, some post-secondary education and or degree um, scores you higher. Uh, con consistently good grades in, um, in previous academic years. Uh, demonstrate a demonstrated interest in the field, and then any related volunteer and work experience you have. And we know through the last couple of years with COVID, it's been very difficult, um, if not impossible, to get volunteer experience in the hospital. So we have been leaning in around any volunteer experience that you can get, and anything in healthcare is ideal, but um, anything that shows that you've gone above and beyond. Next slide, please. So transcripts and documents, um, a little bit of information, upload digital copies, uh, talks about how you, different, the different options you have for downloading your material, scan, take a picture of official transcripts and upload. Um, option two is to download your digital transcripts from your school and upload. Uh, it is not recommended to mail in your transcripts and we do not require official transcripts. Uh, admissions will access your BCIT records directly. Next slide, please. So uh, an over, overall admissions reviews applicants to ensure the requirements haven't been met. So those are the academic requirements we listed on a couple of slides before. Um, they'll forward the complete application to us, the cardiology department. Uh, that indicates that you've met all your, your requirements, the academic requirements, the mandatory questionnaire. And the CASPER test is done um, at the end of, of the application date. So um, right now we're, we're looking at applicants for the September term and the deadline is April 30th. So the CASPER test is on May 1st and that's okay. We know that. Uh, so that particular 30th. Um, after that, admissions will send you an accept letter and then there's a payment um, commitment. Next slide, please. Uh, Julie, did you want to go through this? Oh, you're on mute. 
oh, sorry, there we go. Um, hi, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so supporting your successes. Uh, we have several service areas that can help students with um, their, on their educational path. Indigenous services, student financial aid and awards, accessibility services, student health services, counseling and student development. Uh, we also have our recreation services with a fully functional gym on campus, um, as well as you can play intramural sports. Um, and so that's a really good feature to have on campus. It's, it's equipped with showers as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, program advising. Um, we have our program advisor, Meninder, here uh, to answer questions uh, in just a couple of minutes. But if you have more um, or want to have a sit down with one, this is their um, telephone numbers, their Zoom um, calendar, and their email. Okay, so uh, you're going to, everyone will receive a recording of this event as well as the slide deck. So don't worry about writing it down because you're going to get this in your email in a couple of days. Next slide. I don't see it. I think something is wrong with my side. Meninda, is that the next slide? Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So um, um, I'll take over. Then we do have um, different ways that you can get in touch and stay in touch with our um, programs in the School of Health through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. It's okay. Go ahead, Julie. Okay. Um, I think she's Twitter. frozen. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, can you hear me? Sorry about that. And so, also LinkedIn. Um, so those are again areas that you can get in touch with us. Um, you can see more about the programs in the health in the health sciences area. Can you all hear me? Definitely. We'd like to have some questions um, from you. I see there's a few in the chat, so I'm just going to pop in there. Um, okay. If I'm finished my degree in 2014 and my high school prerequisites were done in 2008, can I still apply to the program? Do I need course updates? Can I challenge the tests? Okay, so there, um, you have to have, they should be completed in the last five years. And if you have other uh, other courses that you've taken at you know college or university, then we can ask, we can look at that as well, above and beyond. Do you see any other questions, Meninder? I don't, Cindy, no. If anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, if you're able to unmute yourself, please go ahead. Um, otherwise, post it and we'll read it out as well. I see another question. How many seats are there available each term? Great question. So we take approximately 20 um students in September for the September start and 20 for the January start and that's across Canada Let's see there's another question here I graduated high school in the UK but I didn't take science although I have worked in primary care paramedics for BC ambulance in the lower mainland um, will this be taken into consideration in terms of entry requirements? Um, I think that's probably a question. I'm just looking at who is it? Uh, Shelly? I think that's probably a question that we can take offline. Shelly, maybe you could email me um, Cindy underscore Maserol, which is M-A-Z-E-R-O-L-L-E -L -L -E at bcit.ca. There's a lot of different um, scenarios that just depending on what you have there. Um, cardio, oh, let's see here. Do you accept out of province outfits? Absolutely. So we talked about, um, we just briefly talked about our affiliation agreements with sites and they're all across Canada. So 
the more from um, across the country, the better. We love to have a, a good um, representation from all provinces. Is the Cardiotech Diploma internationally recognized, Cindy? Can they work in the US? They can, they can work in the US, they can work in Australia. So um, it is highly recognized and um, there is an, a US exam, um, but from graduates from the program that I know are working in those areas, they didn't necessarily have to write that exam. Let me see, if there's another question there. Okay. Are, are there any practicum sites in smaller cities or all in the lower mainland? No. Um, so there are many, there are many practicum sites in the lower mainland for sure. Um, but smaller cities, I, I'm assuming uh, Jen, you're referring to uh, out of town facilities, out of province facilities, and there certainly is practicum sites. There are not every area because some hospitals don't do all modalities, which is like what we cover is ECG, stress, Holter. Um, so if that site doesn't have those things, then we would have to sort of split up your practicum to have some in a major area and some in, in um, the area that you're in. And again, um, feel free to email me to talk specifically about what area you're in and we can give you information about what we have. And if I could just add to that question before we get to some of the others, um, a common question we receive is, can I do my practicum in my city where I'm living? Do I have to move? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd love to tell everybody that you are guaranteed a spot but that in your city, but that's not the case. So we do everything in our power to put you um, at, your, at your home site, especially, um, not especially, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, I find that if you're out of province, the, guar the guarantee is higher. Uh, the chances are higher of you getting a site. Um, because we don't have as many out of province students. Um, so yes, the, the answer is yes. Great. I'll take the next question while you, there's a couple more for you. There's one here about if I complete my high school from a different country where English is not first language and did my associate degree here, can I still apply? Yes. Yeah, so I'm assuming you are a domestic student now and if you completed your associate degree here, which is usually minimum two years, you would have met the speaking and listening requirement with the education you completed here. And if you took an English social science or humanities course, that can be used to meet the English 12 requirement. In the event you didn't, then there is a test you can write for reading and writing as well, but your speaking and listening will be met by the completion of your degree. Thanks, Menender. Um, so you have a question about the job include writing report on ECG. How stressful is the job? Okay, I didn't hear the first part of that. Does the job include writing reports on ECG? Um, no, there is no report writing in the in the in the workplace. Um, there is a need to understand and interpret ECGs so that you can deliver that information to the healthcare and to professional team around you. Um, how stressful is the job? It is definitely healthcare these days is a pretty high stress environment, especially um, of, as of late. So um, you are doing different modalities. You are moving from different areas in the hospital. Um, you have to understand that it, you can you can be around patients that are very very sick. So to that degree, that it is um, a stressful a stressful profession. Um, some would argue that it's not the most stressful profession in healthcare, but there, in order to be successful, you have to have a good, um, a good ability to handle stress. And uh, the other components are um, multitasking and being able to stand on your feet. And there's a lot of walking. So those are other pieces to the, to the program as well, and to the job. How strongly is a CASPER test weighed for acceptance? So once all your uh, entrance requirements are met, your, um, sorry, your academic requirements are met, the mandatory questionnaire and the CASPER test are both 50, 50%. 50 so it's, it's a significant portion of the entrance um, evaluation. 
what is the union that handles the cardiac technicians? Um, the union at the HSA, Health Sciences Association. Okay. How many people apply compared to how many get in? Uh, it varies from year to year. Um, we used to have uh, over 100 applications. Um, in co during COVID, it sort of went down to about half of that, but I just noticed our application pool right now, and there is um, just over 70 people that have applied for the 20 spots, and we're not at the end of April yet. So um, certainly it is a competitive entry program. Um, yes. Thank yes. you for that question too. I can answer this one and give, maybe give you a break for a second or two. Is there a wait list for this program or do you need to just keep applying to get in? So no, we don't keep a wait list from one intake to another. So if you're not um, eligible for a state based on the competitive nature of the intake that you've applied for, you would then reapply for the next intake. What is the cost of the program beginning to end? Um, I have an estimation. Cindy, do you want me to provide that? Sure. So the, when you're in the program, you actually play course by course. So you're not gonna be paying a, a bulk fee for a certain number of courses. Each semester, you'll be paying for the course that you're enrolled in. So it will fluctuate semester to semester. Um, I believe we have an estimation from a couple of years ago. So it's gone up slightly that you're looking at about um, 16,500 for the two-year diploma. I shouldn't say, I said two-year diploma out of, <laughs> so not two years, but for the entire diploma. Thank you, Meninder. Great questions, everybody. I, lo I love that we're, uh, you're engaging and asking these questions. And certainly, um, if you can't think of anything now, but you think something later, you can contact program advising and, um, or myself directly. We also have a couple of poll questions. If uh, now would, I think it would be a good time to just ask, because uh, we wanted to know how people um, heard about the session. Hmm. The question that's come in when you reapply, will you have to redo the Casper test and the mandatory questions? <clears throat> the mandatory questionnaire, yes, you should redo that each time that you apply because things will have changed. So you want to update that form. The CASPER test, it depends on when you've written it. The CASPER can only be written once in each application cycle. So every September, CASPER introduces a new exam and the results of that CASPER test are valid till the end of the application cycle, which is August 31st. So if you're reapplying within the same application cycle, then you actually can't rewrite CASPER. You can only write CASPER once in an application cycle. But if it's outside of that application cycle, then you would have to write the new exam that they have introduced. Sorry, just to answer your question, is that 16,000 all programs? So that was an estimation. So keep that in mind because tuition increases slightly every year. So there will be increases and 60,000 was 16,000 was an estimation. So please do keep that in mind. It's a great program, lots of um, flexibility in how, in how many courses you take per term. Um, the hands-on lab is amazing. Students get to work uh, with, with their other classmates. So that's kind of the first time you all get to meet and you can form groups um, to carry on and support each other through the, the remainder of the program. There are opportunities during the um, during the lab to work in the simulation area. So you're working on simulation uh, dolls and doing ECGs and having live scenarios. And so it, it really does prepare you for your clinical and you'll feel that it's a fun time as well. A couple of questions have come in. During the clinical rotation, approximately how many hours are you working a week? So it is uh, like a full-time job. You're there for seven and a half hours a day. Um, and the requirement is that you don't miss any, any days unless you're um, ill and you contact your clinical, your clinical coordinator. 
Does the experience from other countries count with a certification or it has to be in Canada? Okay, so again, I guess what we, once you're accepted into the program, if you have um, courses that you think um, would line up with some of the courses in our program, then you can apply for transfer credit. We also have a process uh, called prior learning. And so if there are um, experiences that you've had, uh, whether it's in another country or here, that um, lend to, often it's a patient care, for example, somebody who worked as a paramedic or other uh, healthcare profession, and they have that um, experience, then we can look at a prior learning assessment to grant you that credit. That was one of the last questions here. Okay. Maybe we'll give it a minute or so more, Cindy. What do you think? Yes, sure. Do you want to maybe quickly, um, a question that we often sometimes get as well is, um, I was offered a practicum that doesn't work for me. Can I defer my practicum? Do you want to, is that too much detail at this point? No, no, absolutely. Um, so one that doesn't work for you, you can defer the practicum, except knowing that you do go sort of the bottom of the list. Um, so people that are coming up through um, and ready for that practicum will be ahead of you. Oh, there's more questions. Great. Let's pop in there. Are cardio techs employed by the hospitals or the health authority? So you're employed by the hospital, which is part of the health authority. And what are the biggest differences with BCIT and other uh, schools offering the program? Um, I would say the program delivery, for sure. Um, the second piece is the opportunity to go on to advanced areas of study. So that's a huge difference between our school and other schools. Um, the uh, agreement we have with Chief Thompson Rivers uh, University. So that piece to, um, to line up all the courses you've taken to slide into a university uh, degree in health sciences. So that's a, a big opportunity. Just to name a few. The success rate of writing the exams, would you say? Yep. So cardiology technology um, has the national exam through the cardiology CSCT. Um, and our success rate at BCIT is about 97%. So it's pretty high. I see another one here. Are you tied to working for one hospital or can you move around? You can move around, absolutely. Yeah, and often our, our graduates um, do do that. They, they apply for multiple um, casual positions and they work at different hospitals, for sure. So yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it's a little long to read out, but hopefully, can everybody see the chat questions, Meninder? Um, or is so, just us? I think everyone can see them. Okay. So a lot of times um, our applicants say, you know, I didn't do very well in high school, but I have gone on to uh, uh, certificates and diplomas and I have got better marks in some of those courses. And so we will look at, the admissions department will look at um, your best marks. So if that you got a higher mark in biology um, that meets the requirement for our biology requirement, uh, higher than your biology 12 in high school, then we'll use that mark for sure. Does that answer the question? Do, do you anticipate there, do you uh, interpret something else, Meninder, in that question? I think more, the only thing to add to that is that, you know, if you've, it's not unusual for to have maybe some hiccups in your education. So there may be a period of time you didn't do well and then you did well later on. So it, the review from the selection committee can be subjective when you're applying to various programs. And so if your recent education is proving that you are doing well, that will be taken into consideration for competitive programs. 
I see a question saying all your courses must be within the five-year window. Yes. So your entrance requirements must be taken within the five-year window or um, like I just mentioned, uh, a higher level course. So if you only got your biology 12 was a long time ago, but you've taken courses since, then we can go from there. Um, do you accept prerequisites taken through online schools like ICS Canada? I can answer that one, Cindy. Um, if we do accept courses completed through online schools that are sort of ministry approved online schools, if they're approved by the BC Ministry of Education or another um, provincial body. So we do accept courses online. If you're in um, BC, I'll put in here a link where you can actually find online high school courses offered through all the different school districts in British Columbia. And Cindy, there's one question up top. Um, if I'm currently employed under HEU, would my hours be transferred over the new union? Mm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, be transferred over to the new union that if you if you worked at another hospital, is that what you're asking, uh, Mitch? Um, yes, okay, he says. That is a question for your hospital. Um, I believe the answer is yes, but don't hold me to that. <laughs> How much more value in the recent completed high school courses relative to those completed further back? Specific time taken into. Um, so, yeah. I think the, the closer you can uh, take your courses to the program, the more successful you are gonna be in the program. So we have a pretty heavy anatomy and physiology component to our program. So having taken um, biology will help be helpful for you. But in terms of, um, uh, so that's about the success rate, but in terms of being accepted, as long as they're finished within the last five, they were completed in the last five years, then um, then that's okay. And does, there's no advantage for anybody to have finished in one year or two years. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. And again, um, feel free to reach out to Program Advising for more information about the program. Um, and if you have really, really specific questions, um, oh, can I repeat my email address? Absolutely. If you have really specific questions about the program, um, you can email me at C-I-N-D-Y underscore M-A-Z-E-R-O-L-L-E at B-C-I-T dot C-A. And I'll just write that in there. All right. Thank you, everybody. Hope you have a great uh, day and rest of your day. Thanks, Julia Menender, for helping out. Thank you.